<coughs> John chapter 21. The, what I have called in the outline the epilogue. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out, got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, have you any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in for the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his clothes, for he was stripped for work, and sprang into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire there, with fish lying on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so were the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. The second time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you girded yourself and walked where you would. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish to go. This he said to show by what death he was to glorify God. And after this he said to him, Follow me. Peter turned and um, saw following them the disciple whom Jesus loved, who laid, had lain close to his breast at the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. The saying spread abroad among the brethren that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but it is, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness to these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. But there are also many other things which Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. This is the word of the Lord. Let's sing together. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, God, for sending Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you came. Holy Spirit, come to teach me more about His lovely name. Now, prayer.
carefully, the heads bowed and hearts open to the Lord. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you came. Holy Spirit, won't you teach me more about his lovely name? Please answer that prayer, dear Lord for your own sake and for ours and for the sake of those who never heard about you in Jesus name Amen just before we begin the lecture to say to ask rather that the 21 people who are coming to Willowbeck tonight would come as soon as possible after the next lecture we'd be grateful and then to say to you that the test on John is on Monday morning to remind you that Monday morning at 9.30. It is not a multiple choice test. It is not an essay (coughs) test. It's a cross between the two. And you'll have 12 questions, each one of which you're to make an attempt at, without the use of Bible or notebook or any other helps with you. The questions will need thinking into, but they're perfectly clear if you've worked at it. Uh, but you won't uh, accomplish much unless you really work for it I trust you have so Monday morning at 9.30 I hope we're still friends after it (laughs) now chapter 21 of John's Gospel I feel so sorry that we've come to the end of it in a sense because we've missed out three very important chapters but Billy has been doing a tremendous job on teaching the Holy Spirit and uh, he has I'm sure covered them but obviously this chapter is an, um, a sort of epilogue or appendix because the proper record of John's gospel finishes in chapter 20 with verse 30 and 31 we saw that when we read those verses these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is Christ the son of God and believe you have life in his name and that's the end of the story completes the book And in a sense, you return to the prologue, the opening verses of the first chapter here, because in the prologue, prologue, Christ was presented as the light and the love and the life. Those three words which have majored in the whole gospel. Now here, as you've got the outline before you, you'll notice I've divided up the chapter very simply the love attracting verses 1 through 14 I'm sorry the life attracting verses 1 through 14 the love appealing verses 15 through 17 and the light assuring verses 18 to 25 but that in any case if you have your outline you're okay the life attracting verses 1 through 14 the love appealing verses 15 through 17 and the light assuring verses 18 through 25 it's a wonderful wonderful end to the whole gospel you notice you're, of course this story is quite familiar I would imagine to most of you that uh, the disciples became impatient uh, of waiting and led by Peter they went back fishing but the first night nothing caught verses 1 through 3 and in the morning in the morning the Lord stood on the shore and in obedience to instructions which he gave the disciples had a great hall an immense hall whereupon they made for the land we have that in verses 4 through 8 and on arrival on the land Jesus was there and had made breakfast for them and he presided over the breakfast this is 9 through 14 in all of this we see then first of all the life attracting I don't think that the disciples were wrong to go fishing they didn't make a mistake they had to maintain themselves some way and the Lord Jesus didn't rebuke them for doing it 
They just went back fishing. But what a study these men are. When they're, as verse 2 says, together. Together. There was Peter, Thomas, he made it, a skeptic, Peter and Thomas, and Nathaniel, and James, and John, and two more, probably Andrew and Philip. But I don't know. But they weren't to be together for long. Soon they'd be scattered throughout the world, their own known world, proclaiming the gospel and suffering for it. They weren't to be together for long. They couldn't enjoy a little holy huddle. They were sent out to battle. Let's most make the most of it when we're together. Most of one another when we're together. While we're waiting for the Lord Jesus to send us out to the job. We won't be together for long. So make the most of it. These men did their best at the job. But the Lord had something better for them than their best. Something much better. That's always so. They call nothing. And um, he asked them about it. I'm positive he knew. But he wanted them to admit, admit their failure. He knew they hadn't caught anything. They'd have to own up to their failure to prepare them for success. Verse 5. And so in verse 6, the carpenter tells the fisherman what to do. The carpenter tells the fisherman what to do. And now... Love, John, zeal, Peter, are in the race again. Verse 7. It's the Lord. It is the Lord, said John to Peter. And that caused Peter to leap overboard. And soon the disciples are his guests, Jesus' guests, and he's the host, serving breakfast. What an amazing scene. I have given a lot to be there. And this was the third time, verse 14, that he appeared. That is the third time he appeared to the disciples. When else? On Easter Day? on the following Sunday and now here on Easter morning and Easter evening and the following Sunday and then here and here is the life attracting Jesus attracting to himself now we move into the meat of it in the next, the love appealing, verse 15 through 17. Just want you to imagine, if you can, in your mind, uh, sort of get a picture in your mind of Peter that day. Three things had taken place in his life. I'll just give you them to think into. You don't ask, get, ask questions on, in the test paper on this. But... Uh, it's a test, really, of ourselves. Three things that happened to him. One long word, sorry about that. Give it to you, then spell it. Disillusionment. Ooh. D I S I L L U S I O N M E N T. Disillusionment. You're right? Not right. Let me go slower and give it to you again. <laughs> it just means... What does it mean? Um, 
I don't know if I can tell you. Well, it just means a disillusion, you see. <laughs> that's all. That's enough. Look it up in a dictionary. <laughs> You see, once you thought something was right, now you know it's all wrong. That's been disillusioned. Disillusionment, D-I-S-I-L-L-U-S-I-O-N-M-E-N-T. Why disillusioned? Because the cross had shattered all his dreams. Simon Peter. The cross had shattered all his dreams. Sure, he thought he'd be the first prime minister in the kingdom which Jesus would establish coming Messiah didn't work that way the cross shattered all his dreams of earthly glory have you discovered yet how many Christians imagine that the Christian life is going to be comfortable pleasant until one day the Lord puts the cross in our path and we discover then that it means reproach apparent failure and defeat disillusioned you know, never thought the Christian life could mean that but it did Peter was disillusioned but he wasn't only disillusioned he'd been defeated that's the second word defeated you look back beyond the cross a moment and Peter had known defeat how? just a little girl laughed at him that's all just laughed at by a girl that's all when he followed far off I've heard an awful lot of sermons preached on the subject of the disciple who followed far off I've never heard one preach about the others who didn't follow at all Peter was following bless his heart but he's a long way off but he followed <laughs> and many of, many of us don't know anything about the scars that he bore nothing at all the first sign of battle we run away and out of a very sort of comfortable Christian life we prepare sermons on the subject of the disciple who denied his Lord don't look at it now because I don't think you'd have time to find a place and to pay again but um, <laughs> do you notice what Jesus called him here in uh, chapter 21 he said to him in verse 15 Simon son of Jonah or son of Jonah he'd never called him that before except the first day they met you'll never find him saying that before. Simon son of Jonah son of John you are Simon but you shall be Peter a rock and John 1 42 that is just jot down the verse he looked at him and said Simon I know your parents I know your home background I know the place you live Simon son of John I know you you're shifty unreliable nobody can trust you hot headed I know who you are but you shall be rock that was the first day never said it again until this last interview and said again Simon son of John but in Luke 22, 61 don't bother to look it up but put it down Peter in the wrong company with the wrong people outside certain girl laughs at him somebody accuses him of being a disciple of Jesus and he swears and curses and says I don't know anything about him and immediately the cock crew and Jesus from within looked at him have you ever seen the American magazine Ideals published in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin? Tremendous it is. It's got some wonderful pictures in it. And one Easter, there's a marvelous picture. I've, I've kept it, but I've lost it now. But I've kept it, and if anybody can find one for me, I'd be grateful. It's a picture of, 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 of Jesus inside 
the, um, the court, looking outside, looking out through the door, and there's a cock just going away and crowing, and there's Simon Peter, and their eyes meet, and Jesus looked at him, and I'm sure that artist has captured, as a way that nobody else could, the look on Jesus' face. What sort of look do you think it was? You think he said, I told you so. You think he said, I'm sad about disappointed in you. Mm -mm. Did you look angry? No. -uh. What kind of look was it, I'll tell you. It was exactly the same word that he used the first time he met him. Simon, you shall be rock. And Jesus heard the cock crow and saw his disciple outside and turned and looked at him exactly the same way as if to say to him, Peter, Simon, Simon, in spite of that threefold denial, you will be rock. And that look broke Simon's heart. He went out and wept like a child. I'm sure that's how he looked at him. Still believing he would make him a rock. And he did. It took a while though. That's Luke twenty two sixty one. Defeat and despair. Peter went out and wept bitterly that night. I think that should settle forever the place of emotion in Christian living. You'll be afraid of tears. Sometimes when God's word searches our hearts, we're very near to it. You'll be afraid of that. Here then was the man who met Jesus at daybreak. What a verse this verse 4 of John 21. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Poor old Peter, I think he never thought that that night would ever end. Never end, but it did. And the new day held something entirely new for him that he'd never known before. Never known before. Just watch him in your mind. As he and Jesus rise up from the breakfast table and start walking together. And that day held for Peter, for Simon, a new humility. A new humility. Verse 15. Simon, son of Jonah, <laughs> the use of that title must have brought back memories. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these other six or seven? Listen to the answer of a man who proudly had said, Though everybody forsakes you, I never will. Listen to him now. Lord, you know that I care for you two different words in the Greek notice that Simon do you love me more than these love agape God so loved the world the love of Christ constrains me agape love Calvary love do you love me more than these and Peter I can imagine him almost shrinking at the question and saying, Lord, I don't trust myself to say that. I've blown it so badly. But Lord, you know, I do. Well, I care for you. I have an affection for you. That's the word. And I'll tell you why that was. And it makes me want to go under the desk and disappear because you see Peter's defeat was in public and everybody knew about it and his name and testimony were discredited 
Pardon me, but your defeat and mine have been in private. Known perhaps only to God and to ourselves. If the record of our failure had received the same publicity as Peter's did, our reputation would have shared the same fate. Yet, isn't it amazing? We're so critical of the faults of other people. And so sensitive to criticism of ourselves by anybody. Well, all the while we carry in our hearts such a record which if it were made public we'd be struck dumb with confusion. Now I've thought that out very carefully before saying it. There's one thing I desire in ministry in lectures or any preaching it is to be honest with people therefore I want us to repeat this that you may get the thrust of it not to make us feel bad but to recognize what a wonderful Lord we have I'm repeating now Peter's defeat was in public and his name and witness were discredited. Your defeat and mine have been in private, known perhaps only to God and ourselves. Had the record of our past failure received the same publicity as did Peter's, our reputation would have shared the same fate. Yet, in spite of that, we're so critical of other people's faults and so sensitive to the criticism of ourselves by anybody else. While all the time we carry in our hearts a record of failure, and sin, which, if it were made public, would strike us dumb with confusion. I wonder what is there is in my life and in yours that Jesus only knows, and Jesus only hears. <coughs> and you repeat it that last sentence sure reverse gear go back start again I wonder what it is in your life and in mine which only Jesus hears and knows a new humility because because Humility is the silence of a soul, S-O-U-L, before God. Lord Jesus, no more arguments ever with you. Humility is the silence of a soul before God. No more arguments with him. And so... As an older man, I find Peter writing a couple of books in the Bible. In one of them, 1 Peter 5, verse 5, he says this, Be subject one to another, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter 5, 5, he'd learned it. He'd learned it by experience a new humility. May I dare to suggest that perhaps there's some Peter here 
for whom a new day is about to dawn. Holding for you this wonderful grace of Christian character, humility. New humility. Number two, a new loyalty. Watch them again. Jesus and Peter, maybe they've passed the other men and now they're down among the boats and the fishing. Tackle. Verse 16. Simon, do you love me more than these? You think you'll give me up? I'm going back to that? Do you love me more than these? What a word. The students here. And to myself, bless you. Term will soon be over. You know, back to your life. Old friendships, old associations, but you they don't bother anymore. Can't live in a natural atmosphere like Capenry Hall for too long. Bad for you. Get pressurized. Take all the pressures off. Come on, forget it all. You think you're giving up? Do you love me more than these? I'm sure that at that moment Peter's love for fishing died out. The first later on he wrote first Peter three fifteen Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. In your hearts revised standard version, in your hearts reverence Christ as Lord. And you loyalty. Again, forgive me, won't you? The number of times I've stopped lecturing and started fiddling, you think probably is really beyond the point of endurance. Sorry about that. But I've just been doing it to myself all the time. I wonder if there's something in my life, in your life, in that old life, which is something less than God's will for me something less than God's will. and it's got a tremendous grip I don't mean necessarily anything very bad but it just means something quite harmless maybe but not God's will for me and it's got an awful hold is he taking you, taking you to your amazement right past it now and saying do you love me more than that no wonder what you say to him what do I you need a new loyalty, a new obedience, not to be saved, but to prove you are saved. To prove you are saved. Jot down, don't bother to look up. Romans 5.19 and Philippians 2.8. A new loyalty. Number three, a new intimacy. Simon, do you love me? Agape. But the third time Jesus asked him in verse 17, Simon, do you even care for me? He dropped the first word, Agape, he went down to the word that Sam was using and said, are you sure that you even care for me? <laughs> that must have been a bit shattering blow. I think that Peter must have thought his days of fellowship with Jesus were ended. How could the Lord ever overlook failure such as mine? How astounded he must have been to hear Christ lay down the basis of future relationship. Love. <laughs> you love me? Love appealing. I may have said this to you before, but it always strikes me again and again. It was a tremendous opportunity to give him some good, sound, evangelical theology. 
Bible teaching. He didn't. One of the most wonderful promises in this gospel is chapter 14, verse 21. Chapter 14, verse 21. Jot it down. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And one of the greatest experience in life is the fellowship and communion given and received in love. The hallmark of love is intimacy. It always gets me excited when I see people falling in love. I can tell, <laughs> should do by now, Willowbeck has an expansive view. <laughs> Perhaps you didn't realize that. <laughs> hmm. I won't go into it. <laughs> but when I see some people walking uh, down the path, and then perhaps a few days later walking down the path again but hand in hand this time I get very excited <laughs> intimacy is the hallmark of love but just a word of caution on <laughs> from an old man to a younger brother you be sure that you find out how she treats her mother in her own home before it goes too far because she'll be treating you just like that in five years time so watch it <clears throat> how many of us really know Jesus in that sense really know him perhaps you don't know a bit of doctrine but I don't think that impresses the Lord too much I don't think it does really I don't think he's a bit impressed when the student body says goodbye, go home, and they've got a bit of a doctrine tucked in, but all through everything that's been said, they've been more and more defiant in love. That's the sad thing when that happens. Some of you, very few, but some of you, has just wasted a turn right here. A chance you've failed in this one vital thing love. something much greater than knowing about doctrine do you know Jesus are you on good terms with him in the quiet place alone with him I've said before public the greatest transactions with the Lord never take place in a public service never take place at the penitent form never take place in response to an invitation from a preacher they take place alone with God and is the reason why my life and your life maybe is the poor paltry thing it is simply because it's a long long time since anything took place right there alone with Jesus that's where it happens and so no wonder that Peter wrote when he was older that we should grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ a new intimacy oh I do trust that six months at Cape Mary has meant that to you a new responsibility a new responsibility feed my sheep listen Jesus never lets love lie idle. Know that? Jesus never lets love lie idle. <laughs> lie, L-I-E. Just lie flat on his back and do nothing. Lie. Idle, I-D-L-E. That's doing nothing. <coughs> I don't know what failure has marked your life, I know what has mine. But if I confess it now, I have deep, you have deep down in your heart, I know that 
the Lord will have a task for love to do the Lord will have a task for love to do forgive me but I don't think many pulpit committees would have been interested in Peter at this juncture I really don't I don't think he'd be uh, featured in the press as a leading speaker at so and so convention mm. I don't think people will go around the country and get excited about this prospect for a new pastor no I don't think he'd have had a chance not a chance but when the moment came for the most important sermon in history to be preached who did God choose to preach it? Simon Peter that's the kind of God we have <laughs> he lays hold of failures <laughs> I'm sure uh, perhaps I ought to go special slow here yeah. I'm sure there's a close connection between the question do you love me and the command feed my sheep a close connection between the two between do you love me and feed my sheep fellows and girls I believe and I'm sure you'll be with me that our sick society especially in the western world society of which I'm thoroughly ashamed when I go to the third world and many other countries our sick society could be transformed in a matter of weeks to heaven and earth if only love the love of Jesus got through just suppose just suppose the government headed by Mrs. Thatcher and trade union trade unions congress headed by Murray supposing they loved each other <laughs> my <laughs> that's God's will for his people <clears throat> and he's made it possible to love as he loved <coughs> that's our goal, for, uh, goal all of you our goal to spread that love in society today please never judge God's forgiveness by men's forgiveness never do never judge God's forgiveness by men's forgiveness how unforgiving we are how can we afford to be no wonder that years later Peter wrote 1 Peter 5 verse 2 feed the flock of God have unity of spirit sympathy love of the brethren a tender heart and a humble mind 1 Peter 3 8 that's 1 Peter 5 2 1 Peter 3 8 yes that day had a new responsibility and believe me when the chips are down whether you're a missionary or a mission field depends upon your intimacy with Jesus Christ that? whether a missionary or a mission field depends upon your intimacy with Jesus Christ and your acceptance of responsibility feed my sheep and one more thing I think the most thrilling of all a new see what have we got so far a new humility a new loyalty a new intimacy a new responsibility and one more a new serenity now strange word perhaps to some here S-E-R-E-N-I-T-Y serenity it means uh, it means um, if you have serenity you have absence of panic buttons you have a sense of calm and you're not pushing all the time this is a serenity repose Get that? that's the word you put that in your own language and then we have it right because you see in verses 18 through 19 oh my what wonderful verses these are Jesus stands face to face with Simon Peter 
and I can see a new light in Simon's eyes for just as Jesus stood and talked with him before rejoining the others so he would talk to us before we rejoin those with whom we work listen to what he says in verse 18 truly truly I say to you when you are young oh get this get hold of it when you are young you girded yourself and walked where you would but when you are old you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish to go when you are young you when you are older another that's the contrast and Peter found himself looking into Jesus face and looking right down the path that Christ had planned for him telling him about a life and a death which he would not want to go through history tells us that Peter was crucified upside down and in the brightness of that new day he saw a cross right ahead of him when you were young you went your own way and you blew it didn't you when you were old another another that's what Hudson Taylor would call the exchange life when I was young I when I'm older, another. <laughs> it's quite exciting because it makes me I can't I can't I can't leave it without having a look at Acts chapter twelve. You remember? Almost the last last little interview with Simon Peter. He was in prison now. Acts twelve. You remember the story? Oh it got him. Put him in prison. And uh, James, the brother of John had been killed and they proceeded to arrest Peter also and when he had seized him Herod had seized him he put him in prison and look how thoroughly put him in delivered him to four squads of soldiers sixteen soldiers to guard him intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people so Peter was kept in prison but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church and the very night the very night when Herod was about to bring him out Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains sentries before the door were guarding the prison and an angel of the Lord appeared what was he doing? Well, just think of it. Sixteen soldiers, an outer door, an outer gate, and a door, and chained between two, two more soldiers. They really had him. And Peter was, what? Sleeping. Boy. Ooh. I have lots of questions on my little notebook that I'm taking up to heaven with me. And the first one I want to ask is to meet Peter and say to him, Peter, Peter, was I right about how you slept when you knew perfectly well that next morning at six o'clock you're going to have your head cut off? That's not Simon. How do you manage that? Hmm. Oh, can't you picture him? There with these fellows all around him and got chained up to two of them. Sound asleep? <sighs> Would you sleep very much if your head was going to be chopped off tomorrow? Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. My word, no. Send lots of requests for prayer somehow and uh, hope for an escape but whew, how do you go to sleep do you think I was right I know because the one thing he'd be thinking about was the last time he talked to Jesus and he'd be saying to himself how I badly I blew it but you know he, he forgave me and he pointed me to preach that tremendous sermon on, on Pentecost and 3,000 people were converted and then he said to me, he said to me, Simon, you know, when you are young, you girded yourself, but when you are old, another, hold it, when you are old, another. 
But he only said that six months ago. Well, Herod can't kill me in the morning. If Jesus said I'm going to get old, it can't be. So I'm going to come to sleep. Resting on the promise of God. Now, if I'm wrong, I'll tell him I'm sorry. But I think, I think that's right. Somehow it rings all the bells clanging loud, loud in my heart. Any crisis, whatever, God knows about it. He's on the throne in his will. It's perfect. And Peter knew that he couldn't be killed. Because he was going to live. He was an old man. Just note that. And let it get right down, 18 inches below your head, into your heart. The love of Jesus. And no wonder he spoke as an old man of suffering in his life and said, 1 Peter 4, 2, 14. 1 Peter 4, 2 to 14. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal which comes upon you to prove you as though something strange was happening to you, but rejoice in so far as your share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when glory is revealed. So on. A new serenity. And one final word in one minute. The light, the love appealing and the light assuring. Verses 18 through 25. <coughs> just as I've just been saying, the Lord takes the veil away from the future. And when John wrote these words down in the Gospel, don't forget, the crucifixion of Peter would be history, well known to the churches. John himself died peacefully near the close of the first century. Peter crucified. And the Lord knows by what kind of death we can best glorify him. Happy is the person who dies as John died. And honored, honored is the person who dies as Peter died and as millions have died ever since. And more this generation than ever before in church history have lost their lives for the sake of Christ. Perhaps we won't die at all. Perhaps the Lord, instead of calling us to him, will come for us. So all I can say is I conclude this lecture and these lectures is, Lord Jesus, please, come very quick. That would be wonderful. Wouldn't it? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word. Oh, may it bring comfort, challenge, and a blessing to all of our hearts. And Lord, help us just to rest on your promises, to have a serenity about us, an assurance and peace in our hearts, which brings glory to your name. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.